Hi, everybody. This is Pamela. And this is Tracy. And we are here to discuss how business really works. Last episode, we visited with Kyle Rollins from Mammoth Solutions to discuss mobile first. So we thought if you're going to be rethinking your website, then we need to discuss home pages and about pages because they're the two pages that give people the most trouble and where we see the most people just completely mucking up. So we're going to do a little mini series here. Today, we're going to discuss the six problems we most often see on home pages. Next week, we'll walk you through how to actually create an effective home page. And then the following week, we'll discuss about pages. So hang on. This is going to be an eye opener. And these are problems we see across the board. Fortune 500 companies down to sole proprietors. So if you you have any of these problems, don't feel bad about it because it just seems like everybody wants to do this wrong. Mm -hmm. So Pam, what are the things that we find wrong with home pages? We've identified six mistakes that a lot of people make, and these are too much information on the home page, fear of white space, and or filling up your page with all kinds of extra information that you don't need, uh, a lack of call to attention and clear navigation for your users so they know what to do when they get there, too few or too many images, um, pictures, logos, clip art, stuff like that can really gunk up the page if you have too many. Fonts that are visually difficult and colors that are visually assaulting. <laughs> and generally making the home page more about you and what you want to communicate rather than about the visitors to your page. And we're going to definitely go into that one. We're going to go into all of these, but that last point, I think it's easy to kind of misinterpret what that may mean. So we're definitely going to delve into that one as well. So those are our six. Okay. So let's start. Yeah, let's start out with the too much information one. Um, why do we need to be concerned about this, Tracy? What is going on with having, you know, isn't it good for me to put out all of my information so that users can know what I'm all about when they first come to my site? Actually, no. It's visually assaulting, and it creates a thing we call cognitive overload. Mm. And I know you've experienced this. You've gone to a website, and there's just there's so much text, you're kind of like, ugh. I just, I don't want to invest in it. I don't yeah. want to take the time to read it. Yeah. And if you'll notice a lot of the newer websites, especially things in the um, SaaS area, software as a service, they do these really clean home pages with very minimal text. They get the point across really quickly, but they send you somewhere else if you want more in-depth information. Right. So historically, we've always used a home page almost as a um, navigation to everything available mm -hmm. on the site. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that anymore. Today we talk to our ideal client. Mm -hmm. So everything you do on the home page is to get across the point of what your primary thing you do is, what you're about. We all do secondary things, but this is about the primary thing we do. We don't right. waste that great real estate on overwhelming you. You know, yeah. we're not, we don't need to overwhelm you. Get the point across of what I do. Talk to my ideal client. Mm -hmm. So think about this way, cognitive overload. You know how when you listen to a professional speaker, they pause and they give you time to kind of internalize that point. Well, think of your website the same way. Give the point and then pause. Let people internalize it. Don't overwhelm them with too much information. Yeah. Um, you know, your home page just cannot be all things to all people. Right. So let it be about your number one client. That's interesting that you say that because I recently went online to a puzzle I'm not going to say the name of the site, <laughs> but I went to a puzzle website. Mm -hmm. And first of all, the design was straight out of 1999. I mean, it hasn't been updated probably literally in decades if they've even been around that long. But the design was just a mishmash of everything from web 
1.0 or earlier. <laughs> Um, so the design kind of turned me off, but really what turned me off more than that is that it was just like everything they do was vomited right onto the homepage. And I was looking at it like, oh, okay, can I, where can I find the crossword puzzles? Where can I find jigsaw puzzles? I don't even like looking at this because it's killing my eyes. I just, I went there. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And it looks like a blast from the past. And then I went somewhere else because it was too difficult. And they lost a potential sale with, they could lose potential sales with other people by designing their site that way. If I go to a site that it gives me enough information to know, using this example, what kind of puzzles that they offer and, you know, maybe how much they are or maybe the age ranges that they cater to, that's enough. I Then I'll go looking for more types of puzzles, more specific puzzles. But, boy, that was just uh I mean, I guess you could call it a feast for the eyes, but <laughs> I didn't want to have that dinner. I wanted to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But I'll yeah. tell you another reason, something you just were bringing up right there with the puzzle sites and keeping it simple and telling me what kind and then let me go somewhere else to get the more details. Mm -hmm. When you do that, it gives you a better, you know, if you have your analytics set up and you're properly getting information about your website, you're able to tell a lot more easily where people's interests are and where you need to put your future investment. Mm -hmm. um, when people can pick anything off the first page and they pick things and they back up and they pick things and they back up, they pick things and they back up, you can't really judge well. You just have too much like garbage data mm -hmm. and you can't really judge well. But what's our other problem we find with websites? So one of the other ones is white space, and I think this um, dovetails really perfectly on point number one. So point number one was too much information. And point number two, going along with that, is don't be afraid to use white space, just like you don't want to overwhelm your visitors with a verbal assault or a visual assault, I should say, of what you're all about and everything that you do under the sun you want to give their eyes time to rest. And, and I have a little bit of design background, so I can speak a little bit intelligently about this. I used to do design way, way back in the day. I'm not even going to say what day it was. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, but one thing I did learn about was that you can use white space to guide people's eye. So, you know, we tend to read from left to right, top to bottom. And you can also guide their eye to the things that you want them to see, but they need that visual rest in between elements. So don't be afraid to use that. And we've got some examples, Trace, if you want to share the examples of sites that we like. Yeah. A couple of sites that we think do a really good job with this is one is Jill Conrath, and that's J-I-L-L-K-O-N-R-A-T-H.com. Mm -hmm. She does a really good job with using color blocks to help you take in the information she has like in pieces it gives you that mental rest in between where you can really take it in and understand that what you just read very minimal information but you know without a doubt what she's all about what she does what she mm -hmm. has to offer right mm -hmm. from that home page um i also like jeff walker's website jeffwalker.com and the interesting thing about his is it's all white space, but he uses these color bars as a visual separator. Yeah. And it just, it makes it so easy for you to consume in little bits, internalize it. There's no cognitive overload. I think both of them do an excellent job with their site. Jeff Walker, I'm already very familiar with, but you know, the first time I went to his page, there's his product launch formula right there. And there's a link to go learn more about that and to purchase it. So it's very easy to go there and then decide what to do next, mm -hmm. which actually brings us to our next point. Point number three, lack of calls to action with clear navigation. Now, this is a big one. You go to websites all the time that give you a bit of information, bit of information, bit of information. It looks like they're doing things well, but then it's like, okay, that's not enough information for me. How do I get more information? Mm -hmm. Your homepage should have clear calls to action, and usually only two or three. Don't overwhelm the person, the visitor. Make sure you give them where to go and what to do next. So 
you know, like with Jeff, like you said, he introduces his launch formula. That's his course. Mm -hmm. And he just gives you a synopsis of it. There's not everything there is to know about that course on the homepage is I have this course. This is what it's about. Click here to learn more mm -hmm. kind of concept. If you're interested in that course, you're going to move on to finding out more about that course. And if you're not, you don't have to be overwhelmed by that. You can move on down the page. Mm -hmm. You didn't get stuck in all this information. Yeah. You move on down the page and you discover, oh, Jeff's got a book. Right, right. There's a direct synopsis of the book and a link to move forward. So that's kind of, you know, he does a really excellent job with call to actions. He keeps it simple. I think there's only three on the page. It's clear, concise. You've been introduced to Jeff and... If you're interested in Jeff now, he's giving you a clear call to action to continue learning more. Right. Okay, wait. Let's stop right there. I have, uh, we both have personal websites. I have a personal website, PamelaDRittis.com. And I have, you know, other sites that I do that are a little bit more business oriented. But that is my personal branding for me, for who I am, for what I represent as a person. And I don't do some of these things that we're talking about. I mean, I leave white space. I like to have a nice, clean design. But there's no real clear call to action on my homepage. And am I, am I doing myself a disservice? Or what, how does my personal homepage as a personal branding effort compare or stack up when we talk about these guidelines? Because now I'm worried. <laughs> okay. Well, one, know what you're about. Now, yes. don't get confused because it's PamelaDeridis.com that it should be like JeffWalker.com. Jeff Walker is his business. Mm. That yeah. is his business website. Same yes. with Jill Conrad. That is her business website. Yes. Whereas Pamela Deridis is a place to get to know Pamela. And from there, you lead her to Call Time Atlanta or How Business Really Works or any of the other things you're involved in. Those are okay. your business sites. Okay. So... It's just like I have crazyhurt.com. You're not going to come there and do business with me, but you're right. going to find out how to do business with me. You're going to learn about me and all the things that I'm involved in. And from there, you'll be able to move forward to some of those things if you're interested. Okay. So these are two different things. These are, These are more introduction sites, introduction to you and I as people. These right. are not our business sites, so don't get the two confused. Okay, good. That's good. Not and saying I do... these aren't great principles to use on any kind of site, but right. Right. Um, it's not as important because you – I guess your call to action would be to move to one of the, the business sites mm -hmm. um, if that's mm – -hmm your ultimate goal. If right. your ultimate goal is just for people to get to know you and what you're all about, mm -hmm. then it's to move them further into the site to more information. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I do now. My homepage is the blog page, so I don't have a dedicated homepage. You go to my homepage and it's the first post of, or the latest post on my blog. Um, so that is my goal with my site is to have people get to know me and what I'm all about. So I thought that was a good question to ask because a lot of people will talk about personal branding. But when we talk about designing a website, you have to ask yourself these questions. What, when you brand yourself, are you talking about actually selling things? Or in my case, are you talking about you're, you're the product. You're not selling yourself on your website, obviously, but, you know, getting to know you is the reason that people would come there. So that's a big difference. So, yeah. Great. Okay. Well, like, like with Jill, there's three things. One, mm -hmm. she's a speaker. Two, she's an author. And mm -hmm. three, she leads training workshops and coaching. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when you come to jillconrad.com, those are the three things you can do there. Those, that is her, that is her business. Right. Um, she really does. She doesn't talk about personal stuff on there. It's not. It's not a get to know Jill website. There's right. an about page where you get her background, but yeah, it's not a personal page. Whereas what you have is more of a personal page. 
That's true. And, you know, I can change that at any point in time if mm -hmm. I decide to change my business model. But right now, my model is to build up my audience, let people into my life, see what I'm all about. And then if they want to buy from me on my other sites or consume my other content, I, I do lead them there. I have links to those things. Although you're right, I probably should be more proactive about leading them to those other things. Um, but they can get there still. But that's not why they come to my website. So, okay, I just wanted to clarify that. I think it's definitely confusing. It was for me. It can be for a lot of people. So I'm glad we clarified that site. Okay. Uh, that, that point, I should say. All right. So now we've covered the first three. What's number four? Number four, too few or too many images. These could be pictures, logos, clip art. Um, it's just like we talked about in the too much. When there's yeah. too much information, there's too much text. You're going to gloss over and you're going to refuse to internalize it, make your way through it. Same thing happens visually. Um, it's interesting that everybody wants to put up these galleries. Mm. Worst thing you never do is do a gallery on the homepage, but galleries in general aren't even a good idea because when people go to a, a gallery page and there's just all those pictures, they refuse to see them. Mentally, you refuse to see them. Hmm, um, so you can you can do analytics testing over and over again, and you'll find that those are actually some of the least consumed pages, and that they don't lead people other places. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm not a huge fan of that, just from testing them out yeah. um, and understanding you know cognitive exhaustion basically, mm -hmm. cognitive overload. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is like a lack of graphics. And you see this a lot with your smaller do-it-yourself people is they they won't put in the time to get those graphics or the money to get those graphics, and you end up with just these blocks of text on the home page. Mm -hmm. and or they have some really generic, you know, that they got from art, some yeah. stock photo site or clip art, <laughs> God forbid. Oh, goodness. That's true. And, <laughs> and what happens is you, just like you use white page white space to lead people through a page. You also use visual clues to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that you have a couple of nice visual clues. Um, I'm not saying that you need multiple uh, graphics. I'm saying you need a couple of really good graphics. Um, people just naturally, if they don't get visually stimulated in a positive way, not in an overload way, they still won't read your text. Yeah, that's true. Um, so <clears throat> at whatever it is, be it clip art, be it whatever, you hire graphic artists, you go out and take your own photographs. Yeah. You know, Pamela's not a big fan of stock because honestly, most of the time stock is not going to truly tell your story. That's true. And you know, you also have the issue that if you're using the exact same stock image as somebody else that mm -hmm. is duplicate content and you're mm -hmm. not going to rank for it, you're probably not going to get penalized for having duplicate content, but you're not going to rank <coughs> for that content. Mm -hmm. I don't care what alt text you put on that image or whatever. This exact same image somebody else has got, not going to yeah. happen. It's not that I haven't used stock in the past, but when I use stock, I always modify it. I'll take an image out of a stock I'll put it somewhere else, you know, I'll mix things together and all. I never use stock just as stock. Yeah. And I've noticed as I go along in building my sites and in doing research for our show, I have noticed a lot of people using the same type of image or the same exact image for the Atlanta skyline. Mm -hmm. um, it's this image where you're looking, you're the, it's a point of view from the ground up. So you're looking up into the buildings, probably of downtown. And it's an interesting visual image. But now I'm seeing that pop, pop up on a lot of different businesses in Atlanta that are based here. And maybe it's just my experience is unique because I'm doing this kind of web surfing. So I'm coming across these building, uh, these websites more than a general person would. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm seeing this, I notice it. I'm definitely like, oh God, those people use the same. <laughs> and it's not going to give me a bad impression of their business. Definitely not. I mean, I wouldn't be that judgy about it, but it also doesn't make them look particularly original or compelling either. 
So yes, and how hard can it be to go out and shoot your own picture of the sky? Right. Ones? Right. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. um, have a friend who, who, who has an eye for photography, go do it for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it agree. doesn't, you don't need stock. It's just mm -hmm. too easy to stage photographs nowadays. Yeah, that's true. It means ever you can take quality photos just with your phone. You don't even need great equipment anymore. So do your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the one time I will use stock is I go to unsplash.com and I'll use some of their images for the featured image of my blogs. But I will, like you said, I'll take a piece of it, not use the whole thing. Or I will mix it with something else. So it's still telling the story that I want to tell, but it's not using the exact same image as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that works. Okay. So moving on to number five, the number five mistake that people make, uh, visually difficult fonts and colors. I think one thing that we always advise is to use a song, sans serif font. <laughs> I was about to say it the French way, um, sans serif. <laughs> but it's basically a font that doesn't have any ding, like little wings off of the letters. Like if you look at Times New Roman, it has the little wings. And that's, that's not a bad font as far as serif fonts go. It's not too visually um, complicated. But... Generally, you want to stick with a sans serif where the letters are just the letters and they don't have any additional uh, decoration on them. Yeah. And one of the main reasons we have moved to sans serif so much is the fact that people are looking at things on smaller and smaller screens. Right. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a serif, a nice new Roman or something like that when you're on your laptop or a desktop screen. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting all those little wings hanging off the M and the N and the marks on the bottom of the I's and the L's and all that stuff on a really small screen, it can cause the text to start visually running together. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that. You want very clean text. You don't want to ever make it difficult for someone to consume your content. There's yeah. just no reason to do that. Um, yeah. Even if you're an artist, I mean, I'll give you some visual liberty as an artist when it comes to color and, and graphics and things like that. But there is absolutely no reason for you to use a fancy font. There is no reason to get into some crazy handwritten font or anything of that nature. Don't make it difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. your whole reason for building a website was for people to come there and get information. Yeah. Don't make it hard for them to consume it. Yeah, and actually, um, speaking of the episode that we did with Kyle, it's worth mentioning here that the stats on mobile usage are above 50% of people are using their phones to web surf. So mm -hmm. I have an iPhone 6. No, it's an SE. I keep wanting to say 6S. It's an SE. Um, I mean, you know, it's not very big. <laughs> I'm trying to hold it next to my head so for some reference here. It's very small, but I do do web surfing on this. Uh, I don't hardly ever use my tablet anymore. I do use my desktop a lot, but this size screen, and there are bigger phones than this, but that's what people are doing over 50% of their web surfing on now. So you've got to design with that in mind and definitely watch our mobile design, uh, I guess, mobile design first episode that was last week because we talked all about this. And if you haven't watched that yet, I urge you to go watch it. There are things you can do when you design your website, like create different CSS classes. And I'm not going to get into that because it's a more advanced topic than we want for this episode. But there are definitely things you can do so that you can have that sans serif font on the mobile device. And if you absolutely must have a serif font, at least in places on your website, you can res reserve that for the desktop version of your site rather than having it on the mobile version so uh, sorry that was my clock on my <laughs> on my laptop here she's speaking in french um so yeah definitely watch our mobile design episode it's just packed full of information and will help you to not make these mistakes okay okay and last so, but not least is the most important make the home page about your visitors and what they want to do there and not about you. And 
it, like my first question that comes to mind playing devil's advocate is, but isn't it supposed to be about me? It's about me. It's about my products. I'm supposed to tell visitors what I want them to know about me. I mean, what's this all about? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I guess I no, it's not about you. <laughs> no one is in business about themselves. Everyone is in business to solve someone else's problem, alleviate their pain, their frustration. If we're not doing that for somebody, you know, even entertainment solves a problem. You know, mm -hmm. Everything is there to provide something for the client. Therefore, when you create your website, you create it with that person in mind. Mm -hmm. And it's not every client you're ever going to have. And one of the things I tell people is if you walked into, say, a business event, a networking event, in a room of 50 people, and five of them were your ideal client, where are you going to spend most of your time and energy? You're not going to be rude to the other people. You're going to say hello, but you're going to spend most of your time talking to those five people. Your website is no different. Spend your time talking to your ideal client and let them know how you can make their life better, how mm -hmm. doing business with you makes their life better. You talk about the benefits, not the features. You directly address it. So, how is your home page? Are you overwhelming people with too much information and too much graphics? Do you need to tear it down a little bit? Or are you, um, are you pretty much following these rules and you, you're not making any of these six mistakes? Mm -hmm. We would like to know. Share your yeah. home page with us. Um, we'll be glad to give you some feedback. Um, ask us any questions about this. Mm -hmm. But basically, that's what we want to know. Are you failing at any of these six points? And are you going to be fixing these? <laughs> or on the flip side, if you feel like you're doing a great job and you've nailed these six important aspects of your website and you feel like you've set it up in a very effective way that leads the user where you want them to go with the information that they need, then let us know that too. Give us a link to your site and tell us why you think it's a great example of the kinds of principles we're talking about here. We would love to, you know, look at your site and feature it and maybe comment on it. We'd love to know what you're doing right. And if you don't think you're doing it right, then ask us and we'll help you along. Exactly. So if you're watching the video, you can comment below and leave your links below. Or if you would prefer or you're listening on the podcast, you can head on over to howbusinessreallyworks.com. And you can check out this episode, leave a comment, or if you'd like to leave a profit comment, just go to the con uh, contact page and leave us a comment there. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're listening on iTunes, please give us a review. Hit those stars. Let us know what you think about the show, this episode, and the show in general. That will definitely help us to get found in iTunes, and that will help us help you, more people like you, succeed in their businesses and we'll keep bringing you that great content so like share and comment let us know what you think and we will see you on the next episode